Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to our webinar titled Industrial Control Panels UL 508 Alpha Standard, hosted by Intercom. I wanna thank you all for joining. I see we have a few returning viewers and it's great to see you guys back. This will be our last webinar for 2021. So we thank you, uh, thank you again for joining us. If you're new, thank you for joining us as well. And let me tell you a little bit about Intercom before we get started. Intercom is your power system integration solutions expert. We have the power to prevail over any problem, power problem worldwide. We, de we develop custom engineering solutions to meet our customers' exact specifications and requirements. Our main facility is located in East Peora, Illinois. That is where we do all our designing, manufacturing, and testing. We have produced over 60,000 pro projects to date, not only domestically, but around the, the globe in 110 different countries. I'm your host, Sean Lott. I'm the Director of Business Development for the Integrated Defense Solutions Business Unit. Our business development office is located in Huntsville, Alabama. Before I introduce today's guest speaker, I wanna encourage you to ask questions during the brief by clicking the Q&A tab at any time. So at any time, click the Q&A tab and what we'll do is I will receive your questions and we'll answer your questions at the end of the briefing. Now I'd like to introduce you to today's guest speaker, Mr. Robert Stern. Robert joined Intercon family in 2021 as our business development representative for industrial control panels. Robert has 24 years of experience in contract manufacturing for consumer and commercial products, focusing on sales and marketing. Past roles include product development, and sales for US-based and China manufacturing consumer electronics firms, national account sales manager and business development for MSI computer and director of operations for KL Phoenix. Robert is one of Intercon's qualified manufacturer technical representatives for UL 508 Alpha. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Mr. Robert Stern. Thank you, Sean, for the introduction, and welcome everybody to our webinar. So today we're gonna to go over what an industrial control panel is and kind of how it applies to the 508A standard. Next slide. So here at Intercon, you know, we really focus on, on quality. And this is a great statement, I think, that, that uh, captures that. Quality is never an accident. It is always the result of intelligent effort. Next slide. So an industrial control panel, by definition, is a solution of components for general use installed in an ordinary location. They're composed of two or more power or two or more control circuits or a combination thereof. An industrial control panel may have uh, various items such as motor controllers, overload relays, PLCs, sensors, timers, uh, fuse disconnects, circuit breakers, switches, terminal boards, etc. And they may consist of an open panel design, an enclosed enclosure, or an actual just bare enclosure itself. Next slide. So the 508A standard for industrial control panels is defined by UL as being a thousand volts or less and being used in an ordinary location. There are our control panels used in other locations, and we'll kind of touch on that briefly. Um, complying to the NEC ANSI NFPA 70 standard for manufacturing locations. Uh, they're to be used in ambient temperatures not exceeding 40 degrees Celsius or 104 degrees Fahrenheit. Again, they, they include two or more control or power circuits. And under the 508A standard, there is no rating limitation in regards to total power or current. And of course, uh, to follow UL standards, the product must be marked and labeled. And in the event of it, including power circuits, must also have a short circuit current rating and which we'll go over. Next slide. So labeling. Labeling requirements for the 508A standard, you'll see here an example on the right, uh, you have to have the UL logo with the circle, the word listed, a product identity, which is uh, 
talking about whether it's an open panel, an enclosure, or an in, uh, uh, enclosed industrial control panel, and a control number. The control number is specific to the panel shop. So it could be a serial number, it could be a catalog number, uh, it could be just a product identifier, but it is specific to that panel builder. Next slide. So what are the types of typical control panels? Well, a custom built type one enclosure. So a panel builder can make uh, just an enclosure, just a bare enclosure itself. Industrial machinery controls, uh, crane operator, pendants, service equipment, elevator controls are a great example of an industrial control panel. Flame controls, uh, for use in marine environments, such as on a barge or a pumping uh, unit on um, a naval uh, equipment. HVAC equipment, so controllers to control uh, fans or blower motors. And use in aquatic applications, such as fountains, spas, pools, irrigation, uh, even water slides. However, the control panel has to be outside of a five foot uh, water's edge. Next slide. So there are uh, obviously a wide range of different industrial control panels or things that look like an industrial control panel under the UL 508A standard that are actually not covered under 508A because they have a specific UL standard. You'll see fire pump controllers, panel boards, uh, panels for use in hazardous locations, of course, motor control centers, which are covered under UL 845, fire protection signaling, Again, talking about swimming pools and spas, if it's within that five foot uh, from the water's edge, that's covered under UL 1563. Portable power distribution, fuel cell and solar conversion boxes, termination boxes, uh, emergency lighting applications, access control, uh, emergency alarms, anything with signaling basically is not covered under 508A. Uh, medical equipment is under the UL 60601 standard and traffic lights. None of these products are covered under the 508A standard. Next slide. So what are the things that you have to do when you, when you wanna build an industrial control panel that complies to the 508A standard? Well, first of all, you have to determine whether or not your application meets the UL 508A use case, uh, as we were talking about uh, if you were gonna do just a access control, for example. You want to define the power and control circuits that are going to meet the, the requirements for what you're looking to do, uh, which would be uh, amperage, current, uh, what, what you're controlling, uh, the, the difference between a class one and a class two circuit, et cetera. You're going to want to apply the appropriate spacing from live parts and grounded parts. Uh, you're going to want to make sure that you have proper separation of your field conductors. You're going to want to define the branch circuit protection so that all of your loads and equipment are properly protected. Uh, you're going to have to determine whether or not you need supplementary protection. Uh, for example, if you have some internal controls that you need to protect separately from power controls, whether or not the transformer that you're using is properly spec'd as well as the conductors going to and from the transformer. And you're going to want to pick UL listed or UL recognized components to make sure that your panels in compliance were applicable. Next slide. So first off, you got to decide what's what's the platform. So based on the application required, an industrial control panel with circuits and controls may be mounted on an open panel for mounting at another location or within an industrial machine. If it's an open panel, this is always considered to be a type one rating. A similar solution could be enclosed within a box as an enclosed industrial control panel, which could also be considered a type one rating. When the enclosure has been tested via UL50 or UL50E, additional ratings may be applied to the enclosure based on the features of the enclosure to withstand or prevent entry of dust, light, particulate, rain, sleet, ice, rust, oil, and non-corrosive fluids to varying degrees. Next slide. A common, uh, 
misnomer regarding NEMA classification and UL type ratings. They are not the same. While they have similar definitions, the NEMA class, such as NEMA 4, is determined by a self-certification process by the enclosure manufacturer. The type rating under UL is conducted by an approved test lab under the UL 50 or UL 50E standard to determine whether or not that enclosure can withstand to varying degrees of those elements, whether it's uh, direct water pressure, rain, sleet, ice, etc. So, for example, a NEMA 4 product and UL type 4 could be considered similar in their ability to withstand weather. Uh, however, the UL type rating is what applies. So you see here in the middle, you could have a label that shows that this particular enclosure might be NEMA enclosure type 4, but because it was not tested to UL, it only carries a UL type one rating. And this is what would be applied for that particular product. Uh, under the UL 508A standard, there is a wide range of different classifications under type ratings based on the varying degrees of their ability to withstand, again, particulate, non-corrosive gases, ice, sleep, et cetera. Next slide, please. So why do we design for UL 508A? Well, safety, right? The purpose of designing and producing an industrial control panel to the UL 508A standard is safety, right? Limiting user or operator risk to the potential of dangerous electrical current and limiting the potential for equipment overload and hazardous conditions that may result from the breakdown of ground, conductor overload, short circuit, over voltage, or peak let through current uh, from the incoming power source, right? The electrical design of the industrial control panel must comply to safe spacing, separation of circuits, conductors, uh, and provide an adequate risk aversion and margin in calculations to ensure that the breakdown of components unintended to be interrupters is limited or removed. Okay, next slide. So, Selecting UL listed or recognized components is very vital in uh, compliance to the standard. UL uses a, a, a classification system called the category control numbers or CCNs, and they could have suffixes and those suffixes are relevant to regional use or whether they're listed or recognized components. For example, NIMX, which covers industrial control equipment, you'll see here, if it's just NIMX with no suffix, that's a listed component for use in the USA. If it's NIMX2, that's a recognized component for use in the USA. NIMX7 is a listed component for use in Canada. And NIMX8 is a recognized component for use in Canada. Now, what's the difference between these two? Well, a listed UL component may be used, may always be used in the application that it was intended to. So for example, if it was a branch circuit breaker, it could always be used in that application. If it's a recognized component, the component may be used as long as its applications for use is documented in what's considered the UL supplement SA specific component requirements for industrial control panels. So there's a prescribed use that says this component under this CCN with this particular coding may be used in this application. Go on next page, please. Okay, so isolation, separation and spacing is very vital. So spacing between isolated circuits at different potentials are judged based on the higher potential. Spacing between live parts and metal parts intended to be grounded are always evaluated as grounded parts. Spacing on or within a component are based on the requirements in the standard concerning that particular component. Critical to the design process are circuits and spacings as follows. So between uninsulated live parts and adjacent components, whether it's metal, whether it's a, another a conductor or any other type of component. 
between uninsulated live parts and ground or dead metal. Again, got a really concern about arcing there. Between uninsulated live parts and enclosure surfaces, this would be the interior enclosure surfaces, so from the enclosure wall, and between field terminal wires. In some cases where the surface spacing may be limited, an isolation barrier may be used to increase the oversurface value to bring the panel into compliance. Next page, please. So branch circuit protection. So a branch circuit is everything after the last overcurrent protective device protecting a load. So to ensure a load is protected from damage from short circuit and potential damage from incoming supply voltage, the appropriate disconnect is used from the feeder lines to the circuit. And this is considered to be a class one circuit. This is a power providing circuit. The types of devices that UL allows to be in this feeder or branch circuit protection are UL listed branch circuit type fuses with UL listed fuse holster, UL listed circuit breakers, UL recognized semiconductor fuses, but only when used with VFDs where they're specified. And UL listed self protected combination motor controllers of the type E variation. Uh, amperage for protective devices is calculated based on the FLA or full load amperage of the intended device that are within and connected to the industrial control panel and intended to be powered uh, from the circuit. It's required to know the endpoint specific loads that will eventually be connected to the field terminals of the panel to properly size the components needed for the branch circuit protection. Because applications like lighting, heating, and motor control loads require additional margin to safely operate due to their ability to draw large amounts of power. A class two circuit is defined as a control circuit powered by a limited power source, such as about 30 volts RMS. In a class two uh, uh, low voltage circuit design, no additional protection is required for that type of circuit. Next slide and passivity of conductors. So careful consideration must be made with respect to the wire gauge of the conductors within the industrial control panel. All the internal wiring within the control panel itself will be, uh, should be stranded copper wire with UL approved insulation when used both in class one and class two circuits. As a general rule, the minimum wire gauge used within the panel is about 14 Gauge, except for conductors that were originally supplied by the manufacturer to devices within a, a, a class two circuit or a low voltage limited energy circuit. So this would be like a secondary transformer, uh, some type of uh, PLC or sensor device that's used in a low voltage circuit. Again, the full load amperage of loads intended to be connected by field wiring or to secondary sides of included transformers must also be carefully calculated uh, for their for their amperage and ampacity. And when the load or FLA exceeds that wire gauge, you have to use the next highest wire gauge for that connection. The next page. So what is a low voltage limited energy circuit? A low voltage uh, circuit may be powered by an isolated secondary source, such as a control transformer, a power supply, an isolated secondary source of any type, sealed batteries complying to UL 1989, lithium batteries complying to UL 1642, <clears throat> a UL uh, current transformer using the CCN of XODW2, or a current transformer with a five amp secondary. Something to note about low voltage limited energy circuits is that anything below the overcurrent protection device, again, which is as a maximum five amp rating, uh, and is within that low voltage limited energy circuit is not required to be investigated or UL rated. Again, the circuit shall have a maximum open circuit secondary voltage of 30 volt AC or about 40 
2.4 volts peak or no, uh, no larger than 60 volts DC. Can you go next slide. So something to be very mindful of in a UL508A panel is the short circuit current rating or SCCR. And this is the maximum voltage <clears throat> and current of the source that is available to the equipment. It can also be defined as a component's ability to withstand the available fault current when protected by a specific branch circuit protective device. The withstand rating is considered the short circuit of a passive device, such as switches, terminals, contactors, with no means of interrupting the circuit. If an industrial control panel only includes control circuits and no power circuits, then an SCCR value is not required. To calculate the SCCR value, all the components within the branch circuits from the main feeder branch circuit protection device must be calculated for their individual branch and total withstand rating in KA. The lowest value in KA will determine the SCCR value of the panel. Modifications to these the component selections uh, within the individual branch circuits, as well as the type of devices used in the main branch circuit protection can assist in raising the SCCR value. Something key to remember is that uh, industrial control panels with power circuits are required to have the SCCR value on the enclosure marking, and each incoming supply voltage coming into the panel must have a separate SCCR value. The SCCR value of field devices connected to the panel are required to be supplied to the panel manufacturer to properly construct and calculate this value. You can see here on, on the slide, there's two examples. Uh, on the left, we have the control panel, which shows the SCCR value of 14 KA. On the right, we have a nameplate, and you can see that the SCCR value is only 5 KA. Go to the next slide. So elements of control. Next slide. So what are, what are the benefits of updating the controls on an industrial control panel from you know, some legacy hardware or manual operators or big banks of uh, analog relays? Well, you're gonna get improved reliability, right? You're gonna get improved function. Yeah, parts availability, I know a lot of people are running into issues right now with parts availability where you might have some legacy parts out there in the market and you know you have a service issue and you just can't get the parts and, and that's that's uh something to be very mindful of and i think there's a lot of opportunity out there on the market right now so by reducing that component count we get less wiring right there's fewer connect, uh, connections inside and there's less points of failure uh, you can also uh, add remote controls uh, and remote monitoring and predictive maintenance brings a lot of extra value and of course, there's less opportunity of human error. You know, the less component counts you have, simpler the solution and the more reliable that product's gonna be. Next slide. Okay, so updated hardware. So, uh, you know, going to newer technology PLCs and controls, uh, a lot of uh, analog operators can be incorporated into some newer controls. So you can replace a lot of uh, additional external I.O. relays into uh, modern PLC controllers. They're going to give you expanded capability, right? You're going to give, uh, again, higher reliability, uh, reduced component count because you're removing some of those extra I.O. operators out there, and you're going to get more intelligence as to what's actually happening uh, with that connected device or even those downstream devices connected to that control panel. And you're going to be able to, I think, you know, utilize your field service teams a lot more effectively because you're going to get more intelligence of what's kind of going on with everything connected. Next page. So, again, on that same topic of replacing, you know, older analog controllers, we're seeing a lot more uh, installations of, of touchscreens, right? HMIs and advanced integration controllers where you, you have some legacy engines out there that have a lot of manual operators, uh, manual controls, and a lot of kind of interfacing going along. And 
a lot of newer engines and gen sets have built in controllers that can digitally communicate to, you know, uh, to more advanced controllers where you're going to get that diagnostic data and you're going to be able to port that over to maybe a SCADA system um, or output it to another PC. So you can do a lot of logging and tracking. Uh, and again, those, those advanced features are going to be able to save you time and money and resources because you're going to be able to get that predictive analysis. The next page. And of course, uh, what's good with that data? If it's just local, well, you can add remote connectivity, right? So now you can have multiple uh, installations, multiple engine sets, multiple uh, machinery running and get that diagnostic data uh, via uh, WAN or wide area network or cellular connectivity. So a lot of uh, interesting uh, things that you can do now with modern control. Next page. So certified panel shop, uh, UL508A. Some, some unique things about you know, being a panel shop is that uh, you know, you're going to have to comply to, main, uh, to maintaining records, right? Label usage, you know, what kind of product is leaving your shop. Um, we also have to report and uh, request an investigation for configurations that maybe don't comply uh, or are prescribed in the current standard. Uh, you also have to maintain your tools. Uh, so calibration of things like your screwdrivers for terminals, you got to make sure that for that gauge and that size uh, bolt that you're tightening them uh, specifically and that your tools are have a calibration schedule that you're maintaining. Uh, you're also going to work with the UL field representatives when required. So if you've got some product out there in the market and, and something's wrong or, or something needs to be updated, you need to be able to work with the UL field representative to make sure that that gets handled. And of course, uh, you got to provide a qualified factory representative. Next page. So something that's uh, brand new for UL 508A standard is that effective February 1st, uh, every production location that you have, you have to have a qualified MTR on staff. Uh, and uh, that's by address. So if you have multiple production addresses, you need to have an MTR at, at, at each address. Uh, and to become a qualified MTR, you got to pass an extensive training course and you have to requalify every three years and you have to stay up to date on changes to the standard so that uh, you can make sure that all the product coming out of that facility are gonna be in compliance. And next page. So why should you choose a UL 508A solution? Well, I, there's lots of reasons, right? Um, I think one of them uh, is key is, is operator safety, right? And, and, and making sure that whatever your control uh, solution that you use are you're going to protect that end field equipment operators you're going to limit the risk right by using a ul 508a solution you can also be pretty much guaranteed that you're going to use higher quality and, and higher reliable uh, components because they're going to be ul listed or they're going to be ul recognized right that means they've gone through a a, a testing uh, process to make sure that that manufacturer that component uh, is giving you the highest quality piece and that it's going to be safe and of course uh, to reduce in-house production overhead. So, you, you know, you outsource it to a panel shop because you want extra capacity. You want somebody who's going to be knowledgeable about creating that control solution and providing the best possible product for you. And I think that, uh, yeah. So, again, you know, uh, Anercon, uh, certified panel shop, UL508A. Uh, we also do UL698A, uh, which is for hazardous locations as well. Um, but yeah, we, uh, we appreciate you guys uh, sticking with us on the webinar. And if you have any questions, you know, I would love to field anything you guys have. Well, thanks, Robert. Um, yeah, very informative. And yeah, to, to echo what Robert just said, if you do have questions, click the Q&A tab because we do have time to uh, get them fielded uh, for you while we are here in this session. And if you can't find a Q&A tab, just click the chat tab and I'll, I'll see that as well if you wanna, which, whichever way is easier for you. So uh, first question I have for you, Robert, and I'm not an engineer, so I don't know the difference. So there's UL 508, there's UL 508 Alpha. You know, what's the difference or is that the same thing? Okay, uh, well, that's a great question. So uh, UL 508 is uh, industrial control equipment. 
And I believe at one point, uh, 508A was part of 508. However, 508 has now been superseded by an IEC standard, which is 60947. Um, it covers product 1500 volt and less, but the industrial control panel portion of it, which is 508A is a standalone standard. So they're, they're not the same anymore. And, and actually, again, the 508A standard uh, is, is now have been superseded by 60947. Uh, according to UL, they don't really have any plan to roll 508A into any of the other IEC standards, but yeah, they are, they are separate. So uh, 508A panel shops necessarily cannot uh, claim that they can do 50, uh, 508. Uh, that again would be a, a separate standard. Okay. All right, that makes sense to me. Uh, the next question uh, we just received is, is about the enclosures. Do the enclosures required to be stainless steel for a type 4X rated uh, panel? Okay. Um, so 4X is, is one of those standards where it's intended to be an outdoor uh, application. Uh, it, needs to, it needs to be dust resistant, it needs to be rain or water resistant. Uh, it also has to be resistant to direct uh, water pressure like a, like a hose, right? There's a test standard for a hose. Um, it has to have a gasket um, and it has to be uh, corrosion resistant. So a lot of times people do use stainless steel for 4X, um, but you can definitely use a polycarbonate. You can use uh, a powder coated carbon steel um, as long as it, it meets the corrosion resistance requirement. So yeah, it, it doesn't have to be stainless steel to be 4X. Okay, it does not have to be, okay. And the next question is, can you apply UL marking labels in the field after control panels are shipped from the manufacturing facility? Oh, great question. Um, that would be kind of yes and no. Um, no, right, right off the bat, because once the product leaves the facility, uh, you can't just go out in the field and go, oh, hey, we forgot to put this label. Uh, let me go stick it on. Um, there is a process, however, to do that. Um, you have to uh, request a UL field audit, which means the manufacturer's representative needs to go out to that field location. They have to schedule a, an auditor um, to do a field inspection. And that UL auditor is going to come out. They're going to make sure that, that that installation is in compliance. They're going to look at all your documentation. And uh, then they're going to either approve uh, you to apply that label or, you know, they, there may be something else going on there. Maybe the uh, customer put uh, an entry or a pass through into the enclosure. And originally that product may have been like, for example, we were just talking about 4X. Um, but if that customer, you know, put a, a component or, or, or put a hole through the enclosure, the UL auditor may say, oh, well, your label needs to say, type one because it, it's no longer a type four X. Um, so that's kind of one of the reasons why they want to do those field inspections. So okay. yeah, great question, but yes and no. And first off is no. <laughs> okay. And you, you talked on it earlier about the protection of industrial control panels from uh, things like power surges. Is there anything in addition uh, that can be done in order to safeguard the ICPs from, from huge surges of power? Well, that's that's really the, the branch circuit protection. So that primary protective device um, is calculated to protect the, the, the total available fault current um, from the incoming supply. And that's why it's vital to, to know, you know, is it gonna be connected to like, for example, for a uh, 483 phase power source? Is it, being, uh, is it being sourced from a transformer? Is it coming from the main utility? Um, you need to know what that maximum let through current is. So that, that first protective device is, is rated appropriately. Okay. But other, other than that, you can also do an external disconnect. So uh, it, in, in that application where you're going to have an external disconnect, um, sometimes, uh, you're going to, you're going to, uh, put a notice inside the panel that, Hey, the installer is going to provide uh, an external disconnect to the panel. Okay, can you talk about that a little bit more in detail? What do you, 
Like I'm trying to understand what do you mean by external disconnect? So an external disconnect would be, for example, you have incoming 480 power, um, but you have a, a manual disconnect box. And okay. then you're, you're wiring the 480 from that manual disconnect box to the control panel. I see. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right, I'm checking the Q&A tab. I do not see any more questions. Are there any more questions out there? I'll hold the mic for like 30 seconds. And all right, Robert, no additional questions I see coming in. But if you do have questions, um, feel free to contact me and the contact information will be given to you upon conclusion of the webinar. And you can also contact Robert directly as well as one of Intercon's MTRs if you need uh, expert uh, advice or you want, you have additional questions you can need answered of Robert, he will certainly get you the answers to those questions. So thank you again for, for taking the time, very informative um, webinar. Hold on, we may have a, okay, we just, uh, one of the members said excellent presentation. So there you go, Robert. So kudos for, for that. And it was a great appreciate presentation. It. Uh, very, very informative. So I also want to uh, thank you all for participating. Again, this was our last webinar for 2021. So stay tuned for, for what's coming in 2022. And typically we kick that off starting in February. So if you have a topic in mind that you would like to learn about that you think we can help you with, be sure to send me a note and we will add that into our topic uh, uh, box, so to speak. And then we'll, we will rack and stack the topics and figure out whether or not we can put that into our 2022 lineup. And if you get that to me before uh, mid uh, November, right before Thanksgiving, then that will be included in that in that actual discussion. If you are not plugged in, make sure you plug into we're all over our social media and social media channels. So make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channels, our Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, and uh, Twitter. And for those uh, on the, all those accounts, anytime we have any updates or any breaking news or anything that we want to highlight or anything we want to inform you upon. We'll actually put it on those social media channels and you'll get notified instantly if you want to check it out. Also, this presentation was, was recorded. So once it downloads and we clean it up just a little bit, we will post it on the YouTube channel for you to see. And we'll also post it on our Facebook page. So if you missed something or you're not clear on something, you can go back, rewind it, and you can do video on demand and view whatever piece of the presentation you would like to see in, in greater detail. And you can also share the presentation from YouTube or Facebook as well for any of your, your teammates or somebody else that may be interested in learning more about the uh, control panels. So with that, um, it's never too early to say, uh, have a happy holiday since we won't see you on the webinar front until 2022. It's funny because I went to, uh, went to Lowe's last night actually to pick up some last minute Halloween stuff and all that stuff was carried out with, uh, with Christmas stuff already. So uh, we're in that holiday season. So. Have a great, happy holidays, Halloween, Thanksgiving, and Christmas, and a happy new year, and we'll see you in 2022. Have a good one. Take care.